Hello book two. Today's images will not make sense unless I take time to explain right now that they are tributes to the protagonist in the novel we are going to review today. They represent his interests, his hobbies. The illustration you see here, for example, is an engraving of the dramatist Aeschylus. I just learned today that Aeschylus uh, is often shown in artwork with an eagle and a tortoise because it is said that Aeschylus died when an eagle mistook the top of his bald head for a rock and therefore dropped the tortoise it was holding in its talons in the hope that the rock would break open the tortoise's shell. That was a complete digression, yes, but it is one of our protagonist's proclivities to indulge in digressions, so we are still right on theme. The novel we're going to look at today is Erasure by Percival Everett. First published in 2001, I read the 2003 UK edition. So going to the first question, can I sum up this book in a few sentences? A book like Erasure makes me regret asking for that because that's really asking for a marketing pitch. And yes, there was a marketing pitch on the back cover of the copy I bought. Uh, this is what it says. With your book sales at an all-time low, your family falling apart, and your agent telling you you're not black enough, what's an author to do? Thelonious Monk Ellison has the answer. Or does he? To read Erasure actually feels like sneaking into the home of Thelonious Ellison, the fictional author, walking into his private study and opening up and reading his private notebooks. If you've ever read a writer's private notebooks, you'll know that they are, what's the best way to put it, multi-layered. <laughs> you know, writers use them to work on several different projects at once or just to jot down ideas that haven't got a form yet and sometimes they don't ever get a form. Uh, in Erasure you will find that you are, you find a story through reading all these different kinds of writing because each one reveals something different about the protagonist. So you will read uh, Ellison's academic paper, uh, his resume, a short story, fragments of some imaginary comic dialogue between famous artists, and advice about fly fishing, <laughs> as illustrated below, uh, because that was one of the protagonist's hobbies. In addition to all that, this novel also contains another novel. So you have to look at it with a very broad vision. All these fragments combine to create the portrait of the artist as a single middle-aged academic, uh, also as a precociously intelligent child, but most importantly perhaps uh, as a man who is not at ease with the identity imposed on him. As he says in page three, the society in which I live tells me that I am black. A review of Erasure in the UK newspaper The Guardian makes a play on the words color blind and talks about a color bind. That is, this is the story of a black writer in a bind. The reading public, literary critics, even his agent, they all want Ellison's books to represent a concept of blackness which Ellison does not fit and seemingly he is not allowed to alter. Okay, this is the part where I normally tell you about page numbers and how I obtained uh, the book, but first of all, I must confess, confess that I have been a little dishonest. Uh, you know the cover art that you just saw earlier, uh, the same that was on the, the thumbnail that you would have clicked to open this video? That's not the cover art of the 2003 edition that I bought. Imagine me, I'm in Waterstones in Norwich. Right, it's the same day that I bought Masks by Fumiko Enchi, the novel that I reviewed in video five on this channel. And I'm, I'm browsing around those little tables, you know, the ones at bookstores, they scatter all over their floor space. And I happen to glance down and I see this. Huh. Hoping that no one will notice. I pick up the top copy, I read the back cover and the first few pages, and I know that I need to read this book. But how am I supposed to take a book with cover art like that to the cash register? Well, it took me some time to work up the courage. Uh, I had time to come to terms with that challenging image, um, time for all the internal voices in my head to ask their emotive questions like, why and what the hell and what's going on here? Um, in the end, 
I managed, and I paid eight pounds ninety nine sterling, which is eleven dollars ninety nine cents U.S. for two hundred and ninety one pages. Okay, now we will go on and do a short biography. Percival Everett was born in 1956 and grew up in South Carolina. He has a degree in philosophy from the University of Miami, and he completed his master's degree in writing at Brown University in Rhode Island. Since then, he has combined an academic career with a literary one. He teaches English at university level, and he's produced a large number of works of fiction. Erasure is the 12th of 23 novels. His 2021 novel, The Trees, was shortlisted for the Booker Prize. And Everett is currently the Distinguished Professor of English at the University of Southern California. Okay, so now we will look at the setting. Well, the action in the book mostly takes place either in Washington, D.C. or Los Angeles, depending on whether you're referring to the novel or the novel within the novel. But either way, external settings are not the focal point of these stories. Erasure is about conceptual landscapes, if you will. It is looking at what Thelonious Ellison does with categories that his, his culture his cultural environment imposes upon him. Categories like what it means to be a man, a brother, a son, black. It would be better to describe the novel as a journey through these different concept landscapes. Okay, let's talk about the narrative voice now and the narrative viewpoint. The novel writes mainly but not exclusively in the first person. The opening pages tell you that you are reading the personal journal of Thelonious Ellison. But there is a large section of that journal, which is actually another novel, written by Ellison, but he's going by a pen name, Stag R. Lee. That novel has its own protagonist, a younger man named Van Gogh Jenkins. Jenkins tells his story in the first person, but his voice completely different than Ellison's. Uh, his is a, it's a parody of the kind of ghetto dialect that Ellison finds in black novels that he can't stand, but his agent wishes he would write. When you finish that novel within the novel uh, and you return to the main storyline, you find that Ellison is taking the decision to present himself publicly as his pen name. In other words, he has to invent a persona that would identify with Van Gogh Jenkins. And that's when you get short passages of Ellison writing in the third person as a way of describing the, uh, the disconnection and the uneasiness that he feels when he is assuming this persona. Next question. Does this novel fit a genre label? Not really. Erasure is a postmodern work. With mean, that being said, it manages to balance those postmodern characteristics. For example, there are some open-ended character trajectories, and then there's just the scrapbook effect of Ellison's jumbled up journal. But it manages to balance those with a perceptible tragic comic narrative arc that alters the protagonist. Uh, it doesn't make it clear what the ultimate fate of Ellison will be, however. You don't know what shape his ultimate identity will take. Part of the novel's postmodern self-awareness is also its sense of humour. The narrative arc rides on the question of what would happen if a black author got tired of what everybody else considered the black experience to be, even if it wasn't his experience. And uh, what if he wrote a parody of that black experience, just as a joke, you know? But then the joke got taken seriously, so seriously, uh, that it made him a very, very rich man. What then? Next question. Is there anything readers should bear in mind when deciding whether to read this novel? I thought often about Franz Fanon when I was reading Erasure, uh, especially what Fanon referred to as the historical racial schema, or what the mind of an individual learns to think about themselves and about others based on the concepts of race that they absorb. In Erasure, Thelonious Ellison is constrained against his will by the concepts of blackness that are applied to him. I'm going to read this passage from pages three to four where Ellison talks about this dilemma. When in college I was a member of the Black Panther Party, defunct as it was, mainly because I felt I had to prove I was black enough. Some people in the society in which I live, described as being black, tell me I am not black enough. Some people whom society calls white tell me the same thing. I have heard this mainly about my novels, from editors who have rejected me and reviewers whom I have apparently confused and, on a couple of occasions, 
on a basketball court when, upon missing a shot, I muttered, Egads. This from a reviewer. The novel is finely crafted, with fully developed characters, rich language, and subtle play with the plot, but one is lost to understand what this reworking of Aeschylus the Persians has to do with the African-American experience. One night, at a party in New York, one of the tedious affairs where people who write mingle with people who want to write and with people who can help either group begin or continue to write, a tall, thin, rather ugly book agent told me that I could sell many books if I'd forget about writing retellings of Euripides and parodies of French post-structuralists and settle down to write the true, gritty, real stories of black life. I told him that I was living a black life, far blacker than he would ever know, that I had lived one, that I would be living one. He left me. If you look at the description box below, if you have access to JSTOR, I recommend a journal article by Ana Maria Sanchez Arte, where she talks about the representation of African-American experience and how that's upheld as the ultimate goal for every black writer. Uh, in fact, she suggests it might be the, the writer's imaginary glass ceiling, and I thought that was a very telling concept. So, in other words, that identity apparently is not supposed to be interested in Western culture because that's considered white. Uh, so it doesn't matter how capable the black writer might be, how equally exposed to that culture if they grew up in a Western country, uh, how well read they might be in that culture. They are somehow not permitted equal possession or right to that culture if they want it. it it's what Sanchez Arte calls, uh, quote, a misguided attitude toward the self-expression of minority groups. And if you go back to the novel, that is what Ellison wants. He wants the freedom to write about whatever moves him, whatever absorbs his interest, uh, regardless of whether that conforms to anybody's concept of blackness. You can see him taking that freedom when he describes his eclectic taste in music on page three. He says, I listen to Mahler, who is the classical composer pictured here, Aretha Franklin, Charlie Parker, and Rye Cooter. Quite a mix. Question next, is there any problematic content in the novel? Well, the protagonist, Thelonious Ellison, is a gentle, thoughtful person. He would never cause anyone any problem. Uh, however, the protagonist of his novel within the novel, Van Gogh Jenkins. Jenkins is everything Ellis is not. So it is Jenkins who provides the novel with a small amount of problematic content, uh, some gun violence and sexual violence. Uh, but what is the context and purpose of that problematic content? Well, you need to say Ellison can't stand Jenkins either, can't stand him, hates him, is annoyed that when he goes ahead and he submits this joke novel under the pen name Stag Lee. Uh, it's Van Gogh Jenkins who enjoys all this praise from black and white readers for being a really authentic black person. And worse, when Ellison tries to criticize his own book in public, it's his black identity that gets questioned. I'm going to read from page 289 of the novel. It's not that it's a bad novel, I said, sipping wine, then placing down my glass. It's no novel at all. It's a failed conception, um, unformed fetus, seed cast into the wind, um, a hand without fingers, a word with no vowels. It is offensive, poorly written, racist, and offensive. Wilson Hartnett, Aileen Hoover, Thomas Tomad, and John Paul Sigmarson just looked at me, none of them speaking. It's not art, I said. Eileen Hoover said, I should think, as an African-American, you'd be happy to see one of your own people get an award like this. <laughs> so effectively, the popularity of Van Gogh Jenkins, the fact that he is accepted as the authentic black man when, in fact, he is the figment of a real black man's imagination, it has this creepy effect of erasing Ellison, or at least outshining him. And then there's this comic irony that Van Gogh Jenkins makes Thelonious Ellison a very rich man so that finally he has the financial resources he really needs to help his dying mother and his half-sister. Final question. Any suggestions for related or follow-up reading? I don't have any specific suggestions apart from read more Percival Everett. I will say that I'm looking at my Black Lives Matter book stacks 
and two books are calling to me the loudest for my next fiction read. Uh, one is Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye. I've read Beloved a couple of times, but that's it, and I need to expand my Toni Morrison repertoire eventually. Uh, but also Colson Whitehead's The Nickel Boys. It's making itself known in that way that books do, you know, when you browse your shelves. I, I, don't, I don't know. In my imagination, they kind of jump out and say, read me. Okay, if that doesn't happen to you, just ignore me, okay? <laughs> but I will accept uh, votes in the comments section uh, by way of helping me make my choice. That's absolutely fine. And that was another review done. It was a long one, but it couldn't be helped. I mean, some books just demand more talking. I, I can report that I'm halfway through Kenneth Graham's The Wind in the Willows. I don't know if I will do a book review or a sideline on that, because I, I feel like in addition to talking about what the book is, I also need to talk about, you know, why was it I never finished it in the first place? What did I notice when I reread it that uh, that gave me a hint as to why it was so problematic for me the first few times I tried to read it? I also have been considering making some different content, and I'm torn between whether I use this channel to do a close reading or to read out loud, maybe try some live streaming, although I'm not, I'm not keen on working unscripted, and I, maybe I'll talk more about that in a, in a coffee break video, but just leave that with me for a little while while I work things out. Uh, please click the like button if you enjoyed this review or click subscribe if you want to see more of this content. Really pleased that you joined me today. Thanks so much and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye-bye.